Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson sitting in for Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. With us today is Morgan Jerkins, senior editor at Zora, a publication for women of color. She's also the author of This Will Be My Undoing, Living at the Intersection of Black, Female, and Feminist in White America. And she's also a visiting professor at Columbia University School of the Arts. Morgan, welcome. Thank you. To Thank Black America. Thank you so much for being here. And you are one busy person. So before we get into your role at Zora, mm -hmm. we always ask our guests to place themselves um, in Black America. So where, where did, let's start out with where you grew up. So I grew up in South Jersey. Um, my family uh, was originally from Atlantic County, which is like one of the southernmost tips of South Jersey. And then I moved um, to a pretty rural, suburban rural neighborhood outside of Philadelphia. So this is the beginning, obviously, of, of, of your life, your, your mm -hmm. formation and everything. Um, you, um, you also uh, uh, earned a, an MFA um, in writing and literature from Bennington, which yes. is sort of like the mecca for writers in many yes. ways, that yes. I know. Mm -hmm. um, how did you, what was your inspiration? How did you get into writing? Man, so I thought that I wanted to be a doctor like my father and follow in his footsteps because he owns a medical practice in Jersey. And it was when I was a freshman in high school, there was a turning point. Um, I was bullied a lot, um, bullied days on end. Sometimes I was afraid to go to lunch or gym because I was afraid of the harassment. And because I was afraid of retaliating, either through my words or through <laughs> physical force, I became more reticent. And I also just started to create stories in order to seek refuge in my imagination. And so that's when I decided maybe I want to do this long term. But writing was a, a haven for me in the beginning. It was a sort of protection for me. So writing was like a form of therapy. Yes, that's exactly what it was. Before I even knew therapy was an option. Were you encouraged by people? What, what, who were your inspiring writers uh, to, that launched you into going, taking that route? Or was it your own experience? That well, I mean, it was my own experience. I mean, I, I always had books in the household, but I was more of like a cenophile. So I would see stories play out. And, I, and you know, as a child, I would act them out and try to think, well, I would change these scenes if I did this type of story. But when I was really trying to write you know, literature or just novels, what I thought were novels back then, it was very private. Not even my mother knew what I was doing up in my bedroom <laughs> many, many days. And how did this take you into writing your first novel? Oh, man. I think I was just trying to write about a person who was being bullied. It was, the, it was the direct representation of what I was going through. And so I just, every day I was just adding, you know, more characters, plot lines, and things of that nature. And I just kept writing more stories all throughout high school. So when you wrote, this will be my undoing, living at the intersection of black, female, and feminist in white America, what prompted such a title? I had a fascination with the prefix un, unraveling, undoing, unwinding, unlearning, because it makes you go backwards. And for a lot of the anecdotes that I decided to document in this book, I had to go backwards because there were so many things that I suppressed, try to minimize, say it's not that big of a deal. And I finally had the expanse of a full length book to say, yes, this did happen. I can acknowledge what happened, acknowledge my blind spots and the feelings that I felt. So when I say this will be my undoing, I, I was worried because I thought it was going to take a little bit of an ominous tone. But what I'm trying to say is I had to go backwards in order to move forwards. So it was like a reckoning with my own past. And how did this, how did the result of that book, how did it make you feel? I mean, what was your own inner reaction? Was this, was this the antidote to what you'd been going through? Yeah, it was just catharsis. Because I thought if I could just write, keep writing until the end of the year, <laughs> and then summertime comes, then I'll be OK. And then you keep writing. <laughs> yep, and then I keep writing. So my next question to you, uh, I want to ask about the latest controversy, which mm. is American Dirt. Yeah. It's not to disparage one way or the other. Mm -hmm. It's not an opinion, but rather, um, do you think storytellers should stay in their own cultural lanes? No, I, I don't think that. I, I think that what the bigger issue with American Dirt was that we see the inequities of the publishing industry. It wasn't a fact, it wasn't just because the author was writing about you know, a story that was not personally her own. It was also in the way that she did it, according to people of the Latinx linear community. I think that it is imperative that when someone is writing a subject 
centering someone in a community that's not their own and people from that particular community or have connections to that community have such an uproar. That is where we need to pay attention and speak to those people from those communities who aren't getting the massive book deals, the massive publicity rollouts. It's so much more than just the writing of the book. It's the publicity. It's the crafting of it. It's the pitch of it. And I think, you know, moving forward, we have to think about that, that when those who are connected to community say, wait a minute, we feel some type of way about it, that we make sure that we listen to them and center them and figure out what can we do better for next time with these narratives and with the people who know them so well. You know, you said something in that answer which shows that it shows the inequity a little bit in publishing. Mm -hmm. So we're back again to the fact that there are obstacles for certain people. Yes. And this woman who whose grandmother's Puerto Rican. Yes. Uh, but you know, comes across probably more as Caucasian, I suppose. Yeah, but she identified as white. Four years earlier, she wrote in, a, in an op-ed for the New York Times that I'm white. Mm -hmm. And so that's gonna rub people a certain way. Mm -hmm. If you identified as white, but then during the rollout of this book, you say that you have a Puerto Rican grandmother. Do you see how that would, you know, make some people feel? So I'm trying to have, you know, reservation because I am not Latinx, but I think it's just, it exposes just what I said, the inequities of the publishing industry, it's still, you know, it, it's white dominated. You know, not everybody is getting seven figure deals and not everyone is getting like, you know, this, this huge publicity rollout, you know? And so I, I think about when I'm online and this is why I think it's important to be online, even though a lot of people who may not be on, they're like, oh, it's just chatter. It's not just chatter. Mm -hmm. You're seeing people who are Mexican and Mexican American writing about their families that they've been separated from, writing about what's going on at the border. And they realize that like, they don't have an agent. They don't, they don't have, they don't even have, a, they don't have book deals. And they, they've been writing about these type of issues for years. And what does that speak to? How can we do, how can we collectively do better to uplift this vital part of, of you know, of our lives? Oh, that says a lot right there. Let's move on to Zora, mm -hmm. your, your senior editor there now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for people who aren't familiar with Zora, fill us in a little bit on its background and, and how it attracted you to join in that prestigious role. Right, thank you. Um, so Zora started with Vanessa DeLuca, who used to be um, at the helm of Essence Magazine. And it is a anchor publication of Medium. And so Zora is a publication, a digital magazine for women of color. And it started literally last June, June 10th to be exact. Mm -hmm. And I knew that Zora was coming. I saw Vanessa, Vanessa had been following me on Twitter and she was asking if I wanted to write and review the new, um, at that time, Toni Morrison documentary. And I said, sure. And then I went on the website and I saw they had an opening for a senior editor. And I almost did not, I talked, I almost talked myself out of it because I said to Why? myself, I was like, you know, digital media is a very volatile space. Um, there are so many, uh, publication shuttering, um, so many editorial budgets being slashed, and therefore the freelance book was getting larger and larger. And because I had taken time off from doing a full-time job to promote my debut, I was like, well, since I'm out the game, I don't know if anyone will give me a chance. And in fact, when I had my interview and I was going through the process, halfway through, I was like, you might as well just back out. <laughs> like, like, just save yourself the disappointment because I had been through this before already. So when I got the job, it, I mean, it was like within two weeks. And then it was like, you got the job. And I was like, okay. And then I started in like late uh, July. So, so as in, in that role, what are you discovering? Oh man, I'm discovering all the stories out there mm. um, in all these different places, whether it's rural India, where it, whether it's the deep, uh, you know, the, uh, the American South, or whether it's right in New York with the, with the housing crisis amongst black women and the statistics. I'm finding women that are like, no one will take the story or I feel comfortable coming to you because I've, I've seen the work that you've done outside of Zora and I see the type of work you're publishing and I feel safe being uh, working alongside you. And I think that that's so inspiring to hear that women see themselves in our publication and they also trust us as editors because it's their words and it's their digital footprint. You know, the other thing is is that it, it seems as though the experience of women of color is very broad. Mm -hmm. There isn't just one black story, mm -hmm. one story of a person of color. It's, right. it, and so, 
is this a is this a haven for women of color to be part of Zora, to contribute to Zora? You know, and it's funny that you use the word haven because when we were having like our teen summit several months ago, I said that that was the first word that came to mind is like a haven. I want it to be a safe space where we can talk about the things that make us uncomfortable, talk about the things that we have suppressed for whatever reason, and to provide a home for those women who want to talk about it. So that moves us into the Zora canon. Yep. Right, and it's the 100 greatest books ever written by black women, by African American women, spanning 160 years. Yep. Expand on that a little bit, tell me about it. So, it wasn't even a month until I got my job that they asked me what I want to take on this project. And they, I, I'm sure they asked me because I, they, they knew I already had a foothold in the publishing industry and they were like, this is, this is your field. And I was intimidated because I was like, okay, a hundred, and then I had to create a panel of women that could help me, women that I looked up to, and I was like, how is this gonna work? Mm -hmm. And But I, I got such a warm response from the panelists. I'm like, yes, I wanna contribute to this. And then it was like, okay, are people gonna care? You know, there's so much going on in the news, and there there's so many roundup of books, of you know, best books, free, and all these different things, that I was worried that it was gonna be lost. But I tried to tell people, like, listen, you had black women writing and documenting before emancipation. And you see a span of that list, you know, from 1859 all the way to 2019. And I think it's just powerful to see the lineage and the chronology of us writing under very turbulent times. And I'm glad it resonated with so many people. You know, it's interesting because I'm paraphrasing the great, late, great Toni Morrison, mm -hmm. but she always said that if, if there isn't something out there for you, write it yourself. Right. Right, mm -hmm. and is that something, is that part of the mantra of Zora a little bit? Well, yeah, but I also think that because our name is Zora, it, it means dawn, but it also, you know, we think of Zora Neale Hurst, and it's like, we want to honor what, what has come before us as well. You know what I mean? Like, it's a thing where I can say, like, I'm trying, I'm adding my unique voice to a particular topic, but that topic has existed before, perhaps another iteration, and it's okay to give honor where it's due, you know? You also have included in this the, the Next Generation, a list of yeah. up and coming writers mm -hmm. of American women authors mm -hmm. and women of color. Mm -hmm. um, explain that a little bit. So I was trying to have our contributors participate in this. Because again, you know, we're a pretty small staff and we know that we have blind spots. We all exist on the same internet, but we're not always looking in the same places. And so we wanted to bring our community in. So we asked those who have contributed to the website multiple times. And we said, you know, who are you looking at? Like, who is somebody that's inspiring you? Who do you think, you know, has got next? And they gave names, we're like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna include them. So who made the list? Can you think, tick off a few? Yeah, um, Jamie Hadley, uh, Kylie Reed, uh, Diamond Sharp. And what, and, what, and what are the differences between them? What do they bring? Oh yeah, some of them write about social justice, some of them um, write about activism, some of them are poets, um, some of them write fiction. Um, in fact, Kylie Reed, her book became an instant New York Times bestseller, Such a Fun Age, it's her debut. So you have time to do all of this, to teach a course at Columbia, and you're also still, though, um, uh, uh, using your, working on your own passion, which is to write books. Yeah. So you're, you've got something coming out in, in May. Tell us a little bit about that. If you can give us a peek. Yes. A peek. Yes. So what I will say is that, you know, growing up, I have always found, like, these missing pieces of what my grandparents were talking about, why we did this, why we had these customs and, and all these things, but they were, they were always broken. We never really know the basis of it. And, when I, and, what, and, and let me ask you this. I, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but you were talking about your, the stories that you would hear yeah. that were just sort of, like, broken. Murky. Murky. Yeah, yeah that, it's true. Right. It is murky because, we, we, you know, there were things that were also hushed tones. Yes. You couldn't get into yep. details. Very it wasn't proper to ask. Yeah. And yeah. when I spoke to other black families in the North, they were like, we have the same things in our families. And the common thread was the movement from the South to the North, which is a part of one of the greatest periods of American history, also known as the Great Migration. And so for me, what I did was I did uh, a journey in the reverse, where I went back to the South and I went across the Midwest and the West in order to sort of get in touch with my ancestors. I was able to trace 300 years of my family's history, but also, show the connections between those who left their ancestral lands versus those who stayed in order to show that in spite of time and distance, we're still connected through our oral histories, through blood, through myth, folklore, religion. 
and even in spite of also, of course, land displacement. So it was definitely an adventure. And a discovery. Yeah. What did, what did this mean for you? I mean, was it, was it difficult at times? It was very difficult. Oftentimes I was traveling places by myself, but I, I felt so whole and I felt so reinvigorated that black people, even if we never met each other, we know intuitively who we are across this American landscape, and it is ours. It's very different than your first essay collection. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a whole different turn. Right. Uh, what inspired you to go that route, to want to discover your roots? Oh, man, I, I, I always wanted to, but I just didn't think I was be able to get the chance to because I'm not an anthropologist. I don't have a PhD in sociology or African-American studies, so I didn't think I had the right. Do you think, do you, think you needed those things, though? I thought I did. Yourself? I Why? thought I did. Um, it's a combination of imposter syndrome. It's a combination <laughs> of, like, when you think about, you know, being a black woman in America, being a black woman in the media, the opportunities that you don't get, and the further along you get in your career, you realize it's not a matter of my ability. It's a matter of being given a chance. Mm. So when I found out that... Harper was like, yeah, we believe in you to do this. I was like, well, then I need to believe in myself then. <laughs> you know, I had this idea. Someone else believes that it, it's legitimate. And the fact that I was able to see it through to this actual book now, it, it, it still kind of blows my mind a bit. You know, you've been, speaking of the media, you've been a part of it for also a very long time. Mm -hmm. And what are, what are the um, obstacles that you faced in in your ascension to where you are today? I mean, when I was studying... I know we don't have a whole other hour. Oh, no, but. that's okay. <laughs> I mean, when I was studying at Princeton, I was told that I had to do unpaid internships in order to get a foothold in the publishing industry. And I did that. I, I did unpaid internships. I had a friend of mine who recently moved to the city. I was sleeping on her couch in a non-air conditioned apartment for $60. She only said, you can only have to pay what you want to come here. And I was doing that. Um, and then when I graduated, when I was on the verge of graduating, I said, okay, I got the Princeton degree. I have a literary background. I have the unpaid internships. I couldn't even get an editorial assistant gig. And when I was going to these interviews, I, the editorial assistants who I was shaking hands with, none of them looked like me. And it was debilitating to graduate from at the t you know the number one university in the country, and not have a job. And so for me, when I was back at home, you know, down the dumps, I saw all this content being exchanged online, produced online. And I was like, oh, people can write online. People my age and get paid for it. And I just started to do that. And so it, that's what turned it around. Yeah, it was the, it was the internet. And and I tell people all the time, like I'm glad I'm in a position I could be honest about it. But it should not have been that hard. Mm. And there are so many others like myself who did the internships, who got the degree, and they cannot get even a, a, an editorial assistant position. So, what's your advice to those girls right now who are watching this and who are feeling like you felt in the doldrums a little bit? back at your parents' house? You know, I, I would say that it, 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 this isn't the end. I think I just saw it as a finality that I was going to be stuck in South Jersey forever. <laughs> and I would just say that this isn't the end. I would say to, you know, pay attention to the people that you admire. Don't be afraid to shoot them an email because you never know who's going to respond. That happened for me. Um, I, I mean, I reached out to Roxane Gay when I was still living in South Jersey and she wrote the blurb for my book. And she, she didn't even, she never even met me in person at that time. So you never know how things are going to come full circle. Well, it's also, you're, you know, going back again to doubting yourself. I mean, we all have that in yep. ourselves. Like, mm -hmm. if I'm not getting this, what's wrong yep. with me? Yep. What am I doing yep. wrong? And when you take that step back, mm -hmm. right, you sort of say, well, look, you tick off, you tick off all the boxes. Mm -hmm. I graduated, I did this, da, 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 da. So wait, what's wrong with them? Right, right. right. But it's hard to do that because if, you, if you're a black woman in this country, you felt like you have to do everything and you're conditioned to be like, well, maybe if I try harder because that's the myth of the meritocracy. And, I, and like I said earlier, when you realize after a while, and I think this happened with my first book and it happened with the creation of my second book, that it was never about my ability. Mm -hmm. It was the fact of giving a chance. It is a bittersweet epiphany, I would say. You know, um, Malcolm Gladwell has said in one of his books, I forget, uh, that you always along the way, will you get that person who will give you that little push, that first rung on the ladder yep. and the rest of it, yep. it's up to you. Mm -hmm. 
Is that something, is that a mantra that you follow a little bit or that you might believe some version of that? Yeah, some people just want a chance. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? You know, we all have different bandwidths, but one of the things that I pride myself on, you know, when I was back when I was an editorial assistant at a literary uh, organization called Catapult and even at Zor is that, you know, some people, you just got to work with them a little bit. They may not have had the degree, they may not have had the, the mentorship or whatever. But I, I like to be on the ground with writers and say, hey, this is what you should do. And let me give you a heads up. This is what you should do for the future and take that with you. But pass it on once you get that next byline or once you get that book deal. Pass it on to somebody else. That's right. When you're on that ladder, don't yeah. kick the person behind pass you. Pass it on. And even yeah. when I can't take on a sign, I say, okay, I can recommend someone for you. It's just that simple. Speaking of mentors, tell me the role your mother played in your life. You know, my mother is just one of the most amazing people I've ever met. Um, she's so full of love. She's so full of wisdom and pizzazz. And she, she always tried to nurture me and try to uplift me, even though I, I, had, I had such low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and she knew who I was. She also tried to protect me, try to let me know to be mindful of where you are in certain spaces. Have your back, because you may be in places where people don't have yours. And you know, she also taught me to work hard, but now we're in a stage in our relationship where we're trying to learn what it means to rest. <laughs> <laughs> it was such work Be mindful. Yeah, and be mindful of yeah. that, where you have yeah. to just have fun, you mm -hmm. know? And meditate a and little And meditate. Bit. Mm -hmm. what what are some of the, the tips she gave you along the way? I mean, uh, you know, Morgan Jerkins is here today thanks to a mother who did. Yeah, for, because a mother <laughs> who supported her. My mother, yes, she was worried about how was I going to fend for myself as a writer. It's not a linear path when it, like if you were to do medicine or law. Um, but she knew that I wanted to do it. And because I come from a musical family, you know, you know, a lot of the, you know, there, um, two of my uncles are in the music industry and they didn't have college degrees, but they had a work ethic and they had a discipline and they saw it through and, and they got great returns from it. So I think that sort of helped too. But she was like, well, you know, she just artsy, but on the other, another side of the spectrum. And she <laughs> helped to cultivate that. She, she never, um, you know, tried to make it seem like it was a small hobby that, that, that would just mm. pass after a certain amount of months or years. So it's, it's been in your DNA, basically. Mm. Yep. It's just a, a question of, of discovering it and, and, and nurturing it. Yes. Um, I want to go back to Zora for a second, okay. uh, which is you know, your, your pride and joy, it right. seems, too. Uh -huh. what, what makes it different? What makes it stand out from other publications? Well, I would say that it is a publication specifically for women of color women of color and also non-binary folks. And so what I think is great about that is that you don't really see a lot of publications like that. Also our masthead is all <laughs> women of color, black women or women of the diaspora. So it, it, it's just like, like you said, it's a haven for that. Um, and also, you know, we do op-eds, personal essays, reported features, um, deep dives and it spans literature, it spans politics, it spans visual art, um, and it spans just what you can think of. So it's like, even though we're a baby pub, you know, someone said the other day, you're becoming one of my, my new favorite prestige outlet. Yeah. And we're like, great, you know, that, that's wonderful. So that you know that like you can go here, but you can also come here. You always have a home here. That is fantastic. Thank you. What is the, the lesson you want the next generation to walk away with when they read your writing? Don't ask for permission. Don't ask for permission. Um, for me, I'm a little bit impatient, I'll say that. It's something I'm working on, but I always told myself, you know, don't wait for that train to arrive because once it might arrive, it might be full. So write what you wanna write. If someone says no, keep it moving because you never know, a little bit down the line, that person might come to you instead. And so always just be working on your craft. You know, be mindful of what's going on the internet, but know that the internet cannot take the place of a work ethic and a discipline and an attention to detail. You know, and, and speaking of the internet and social media, it's, it, it has, you know, particularly now, yeah. um, it's, it's a home for a lot of bad stuff, a lot of hate, you know, right. fill, fill in what you yep. want, the negative. But it's also, you've seen it as something very helpful, yeah. and beneficial right. for yourself. Right. How, you know, talk a little bit about the good aspects of it and what it did for you and what it can do for other people. Right, if, if it were not for the internet, I would not be where I am right now. Um, I would probably still be an editorial assistant.
Mm-hmm. Um, which is not a bad thing. We would say it would. I would not have accelerated in the way that I have. Um, I met my agent through Twitter. Um, the acquiring editor from my first book. <laughs> um, she met me through Twitter. Um, the my, bylines were through people seeing me online. What I found was a destabilization, if you will, between the academy, the ivory tower, and all of the inaccessible knots they often have, and those who are on the ground working. And on Twitter, there just seems to be a melange of Mm -hmm. these different, what I like to call knowledge productions, where you can always come away informed with something. And it's a lot of times people are doing this for free. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, some of the black women have taught me, they were making threads for free, you know? And I think that in a way, like, yes, the the internet could be a hateful place, but to be able to connect with others on all sides of the globes that affect you on a macro level and a micro level, that could be both broad and extremely intimate, is something that keeps me online. Good, good, good. (laughs) That makes sense. (laughs) So we always ask our guests to finish this statement. Mm -hmm. The power, the strength of black America lies in? Our storytelling. That's what I would say. Storytelling. Mm -hmm. The stories persist throughout the centuries. It's what keeps us going. in spite of whatever's happening to us, it keeps us inspired and it makes us remember those who came before us and those who are to come. And is it also because um, so many in the past have tried to muzzle those stories? Absolutely, and they couldn't because if they did, you and I wouldn't be sitting here. That's true. Thanks to Morgan Jerkins, senior editor at Zora, and look out for her new book to be released in May 2020, Wandering in Strange Lands. Thanks to you for watching. We'll see you next time. And I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson sitting in for Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America.